with a, a, a guest for class, and so we wanted to open it up and include it, uh, include a lot more people uh, in the in the evening. And so glad you guys are you're here, and it's going to be a great opportunity to get, get to know Al Cooper and hear about his story. I just want to give you a little introduction on his background, and then I'll have him come up and and, uh, and join me up here. Um, uh, Mr. Cooper is from, from New York City. He started in the music industry very young. He told me a, just an incredible story this morning how he used to go as, I think, an 11-year-old down and uh, sneak in to hear Ray Charles rehearse, James Brown rehearse in the studio above the Ed Sullivan Theater. He went on after that to, he actually had a, uh, his first pop hit was when he was 14 years old in a band. Um, he got to know uh, Paul Simon in the early 60s, worked with him. Uh, before anyone knew who Paul Simon was. And uh, he went on, and his first uh, real, real, something, real, real claim to fame was actually a, a number one song by uh, Gary Lewis and the Playboys called This Diamond Ring in 1965. Um, he's, he's known so much for his work with Bob Dylan, which would include um, 1965. Um, he, uh, he played the trademark organ riff on Dylan's recording of Like a Rolling Stone which is the number one song in Rolling Stone Magazine's greatest song of all time list. In July of that same year, 1965, he was in Bob Dylan's band at the Newport Folk Festival, where uh, it, was a it was Dylan's big debut as an electric artist, and it was very controversial. And it, controversial. it was actually, it was number five on Rolling Stone's list of 50 moments that changed the history of rock and roll. And really, one of the main reasons he's here tonight is, is we're talking about the making of the Blonde on Blonde record, and that was made right on the other side of that wall in uh, Columbia Studio A. This was in the 60s. This room was known as Columbia Studio B. Well, Blonde on Blonde was made there, and it was actually 46 years ago uh, this past week. And uh, Mr. Cooper played on the entire record, uh, played organ on every song. He helped uh, oversee much of the sessions and taught the band. And most people would say Blonde on Blonde, most critics would put that in the top, one of the top ten records of all time. Many critics would say it's the best record of all time, which would, I would be included in that list uh, in terms of the best recording ever made. Um, and Al's signature playing, of both on the Highway 61 record and on the Blonde on Blonde record, is really kind of the, the organ style. It's a trademark style that people have copied ever since then. It's part of kind of rock and roll history. After his work with, um, with Dylan, he went on to do so many other things, including he put together a, a, a very famous blues record with Stephen Stills and Michael, uh, Michael Bloomfield called The Super Session. And um, it, it's one of those records that people look back to, and even just talking to Mark Bowman yesterday, he, he even said how he could even see that being as sort of the foundation for so many jam bands that have come on since then. That was 1968. In 67, Al formed uh, Blood, Sweat, and Tears, which was a uh, an interesting sound. It was kind of really the first mix of a, of a jazz rock style. Basically, it was a group that, that combined rock elements, R&B elements, and horn arrangements, and nothing like that had really been done at that point. So he really revolutionized that and, and kind of started with that style. Um, in, in 68, he was the uh, uh, staff producer and A&R guy at, at Columbia Records, and he spearheaded uh, one of the best records in the 60s that's really critically acclaimed by the zombies called Odyssey and Oracle. If you haven't heard that record, you need to find it. And um, in the early 70s, he discovered uh, In a Little Club and developed and produced Leonard Skinner. He uh, found them and developed them, produced their first three albums, which included Sweet Home Alabama and Free Bird, two of the probably the signature songs from the 70s. Um, and beyond that, he's, you know, he's played with just about everybody, from uh, Jimi Hendrix, Chuck Berry, B.B. King, uh, he's been involved in recordings and performances with George Harrison, Tom Petty. The list is, is really endless. And, and along with that, really helping to establish so many different genres and new things in terms of music over the years. So we're really excited to have Al here tonight to talk about the making of the Blonde on Blonde record. So welcome, Al Cooper. Should have hobbled out. <laughs> Thanks, Al, for being with us. I really appreciate it. And, and I know the students here. We we've got a, a class of students that are committed to studying music history, and they're big fans of not only uh, your work but so much of, of what you've done over the years. And so it's it's great to have you here to uh, to talk about it and tell them firsthand about um, 
about some of these records. I'd love to just hear it. I know it's a, it's a story you've told many times, but just, I know it's a great one, just the story of how you got involved in the Highway 61 record, and particularly like a Rolling Stone. You know, I refuse to tell that story it's because I, I think I've logged in uh, at, at least a million times I've told it. Okay. And, and it's in the, the Martin Scorsese movie uh, of me telling it. Okay. So I, when I saw that, I said, good, I don't have to tell it's it. It's over. Again. <laughs> so uh, if you don't know it, that's, that's a good place to rent it and uh, See it. Okay. Good. <laughs> it is a good story. But it is good. It's, yeah. so it's like, you know, if you told the, the greatest joke ever told and you had to tell it for the rest of your life, which is sort of what that is to me. Right. Okay. Well, anything about the making of that record that you did, that just in terms of that, kind of how that started for you? You'd like to talk about any stories from that? I was just Yeah. Yeah. It was uh, uh, a very uh, chaotic. Uh, mood, uh, which allowed me to sneak in and play. Uh, but th there was no uh, producer, artist thing going on at all. It was all uh, Bob trying to get these songs done with a, a, a studio band, and, and he brought Mike Bloomfield with him to the sessions. And uh, I had read about Mike Bloomfield, but I had never met him. And uh, fortunately, we got along very well. And then once, once I was invited to come back and play on the whole album, uh, I got my best friend in as the bass player, uh, Harvey Brooks. And so there were uh, Bob Dylan, Mike Bloomfield, me and Harvey Brooks, uh, four, uh, got, uh, four Jews about the same age, <laughs> all forging a new sound. It's good. It's good. Well, we were talking this morning just how that, I, th I think it's interesting that that wasn't your primary interest in, instrument, that you were really a guitar player, and all of a sudden you became the organ player for so many people after that. Well, it was after hilarious. Yeah, yeah. It was <laughs> I, I started out uh, playing keyboards. I mean, that was the first one. I was about six years old. My, my uh, parents took me to one of their friends' houses, and they had a piano, and I never had access to a piano before. So I just, like, attacked it. And, and they went and did what parents do with their friends. And, and I was in there, you know, with this piano for about two and a half hours. And, when they came to take me home, I would figured out how to play the number one song that was out at the time, which was the Tennessee Waltz on the Black Keys. And that was uh, uh, 1950. That's great. So I, uh, before that, I had no idea that I had any affinity to any music or anything, just that I liked it. My mom played the top 40 in the house all the time on the radio. So there was a lot of music in the house, but, but nobody in my family had any musical talent or anything like that. And we couldn't afford a piano. So years went by and finally they bought me a, you know, a spinet piano and uh, that was the year that Elvis Presley came out, and I switched to guitar. Is that <laughs> <laughs> Still feel bad about right? <laughs> Oh, by the way, I just want to ask you guys, if, if you've been doing flash photography, we appreciate that. Welcome to take pictures, but make sure your flash is off on your phone, okay? Um, well, how about, that? I know that another, different versions of the story, the Newport, New, the Newport Folk Festival uh, appearance, the electric performance that you kind of jumped in on as well. Love to hear your version of what really happened with that with that story too. That summer, 1965. Well, starting about 1963, I used to go. I used to buy tickets and go to the Newport Folk Festival because a lot of my friends would go and we'd meet there and like that camaraderie, post college camaraderie. Sure. And and so this was no different except that I had just finished recording the Highway 61 record. 
And, uh, and I had uh, relatives in uh, Boston, so I'd go up and see my relatives, and then I'd go to Newport every year. So there I was, and like I said, I bought tickets, and uh, I got there the first day, and I was walking around the workshops, and uh, Albert Grossman, Bob's manager at the time, came over to me and said, uh, boy, we've been trying to find you for about a week. And I said, oh, I was on the road. I was, you know, visiting my family. And uh, I think this is pre-answering machines also. <laughs> uh, so, so he said, uh, here's some uh, uh, all-access passes. Uh, can you uh, meet us backstage tonight? Bob wants to talk to you. I said, sure. And I went, all access passes. This is fabulous. <laughs> so I immediately sold my tickets, <laughs> and, uh, and and then I, you know, met them. That night and Bob said, uh, uh, "Would you play with me Sunday night? I want to play, you know, with a band behind me." So I said, "Sure." I said, "I know all the songs," and uh, uh, and he had uh, Bloomfield as well, and. He was going to use uh, the band that Bloomfield was in, which was the Paul Butterfield band, because they were playing at the festival as well. And so Saturday night, we went to some millionaire's mansion in Newport that they had gotten for us, and we rehearsed what we were going to play. And uh, with all due respect to the uh, Butterfield band, they weren't the band that, would, that could best play these songs. But Bloomfield was in the band. That, that was the good part of it. Not that they were bad. Like I said, they were a great blues band. But there's a difference between playing the blues and like a Rolling Stone. It's different. And so we, we stayed up all night. I mean, it was dawn when we left. And we, had figure, and we could play three songs, which is ridiculous. So that's what we did. We played three songs. And, and he was the star of the entire weekend, the, the whole folk festival. And most people played 45 minutes to an hour set. That's what the, the festival said you could do. So we came out and played three songs, which was probably 20 minutes. And he was the headliner. So people weren't happy about that. Because people had traveled from all over the world and sat through music they didn't understand to hear Bob play 20 minutes. So that's what upset the people, not the electricity, the fact that he was playing with a band. That didn't upset, that upset some people, but most of the people were like, 20 minutes, what is this? So. I was standing backstage when we came off, and Peter Yarrow was the MC from Peter, Paul, and Mary. And he said, he was talking to Bob, he said, you can't just leave them like that. He said, that's all we know. That's all we could rehearse. He said, well, why don't you uh, go out and play a couple of acoustic songs? He said, I, I didn't bring my acoustic guitar. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, well, here, take mine, but you got to go out there. You can't just leave them like that. And I said, all right. And, and I mean, I didn't think much of our performance at, at that show because of all those things I just mentioned. But when he went out and played acoustically to this audience, It's All Over Now, Baby Blue, I thought that was unbelievable because of the lyric. And, and I went, now, now there's something for all time. But the show itself, uh, uh, I'm actually sorry that it was filmed. <laughs> that was one of my favorite moments. By the summer of 65, which was the, uh, the Highway 61 record, and then come as early as uh, February of 66 is when you guys arrived here, I believe, February, March of 66. To make, yeah, the blonde, to make the Blonde on Blonde record. Mm -hmm. How did you feel about coming to Nashville? What did you think about coming here? And, and why was Nashville the place that... Um, well, when I did... Did the Blonde on Blonde record the story? 
When I did uh, the Highway 61 album, I was uh, 21, right. which is hilarious also. <laughs> and, and also a big Bob Dylan fan. So it was like, you know, somebody opened the magic door and all these things started happening to me. But on the organ, I didn't expect that. I went there, uh, uh, and then you're going to make me tell the story. <laughs> I'm not falling for that. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, uh, but I, I was, uh, since the Elvis time, I was a guitar player, and I, and I had been in a, a, a band that was popular uh, playing guitar. And I played sessions on guitar uh, for other people. So it was, uh, and then now all of a sudden everyone's calling me to play organ and I, I barely, it's very complicated to turn on a Hammond organ. <laughs> it, it's like a three-step procedure. And if you don't know anything about that, you could not play the organ. So at the, at the uh, like a Rolling Stone session, they moved the organ player over to piano. And I was planning to play guitar. And, uh, and then I, I was out in the studio and I, uh, and I sat next to Mike Bloomfield and bef about 45 minutes before the session was supposed to start. And, and Mike Bloomfield, who I had never met, sat down and started warming up. And I went, oh my God. <laughs> I can't do this. Because I never heard anybody play like that, especially somebody who looked to be my age. I went, you know, because I, I thought, you know, I was pretty good. I wasn't. <laughs> and, uh, and that's how I learned it. So I like, lit up a cigarette and uh, put my guitar in the case and went back in the control room. And I went, I'm not, I guess I'm, my plan isn't going to work here. And, uh, and then they moved the organ player to piano, and I went to the producer, who was the person that invited me to the show, and I said, uh, why don't you let me play the organ? I got a really good part for this, which was total. <laughs> I didn't have anything. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and he said, uh, you're, you're not an organ player, you're a guitar player. And I said, so? And, and, and then they called him to the phone, he had a phone call. So I said to myself, he didn't say no. And I, went, and I had played the organ on some demo sessions when I, uh, from songs that I wrote. But I really didn't know how to work it, it's a very complicated machine. So I went out to the organ when he went to the phone and I sat down and I went, oh, thank God they left it on. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise this wouldn't work either. So, so, when I, so when I had to, uh, after like Rolling Stone was so big, people called me to play the organ on the sessions. And, it, and uh, so I said, well, first thing I have to do is learn how to turn on the organ. <laughs> So somebody taught me how to do that, which must be, have been hilarious for them. <laughs> and, uh, and then I started playing on other people's records. Uh, and you know, they all wanted the same thing. They wanted that sound of what was on like a Rolling Stone, which was convenient, for, I mean, because you know, I just started playing. I don't know how to work all those switches and bars and things. <laughs> Unbelievable, and uh, uh, so, and as I said prior to that, I played guitar on a bunch of sessions. Uh, so now, for the first time, th they wanted me to go out of town and play on a record. So from from the time I was fourteen, which is when I first started doing that, that's another story. Uh, I had played in the studio. So that was <coughs> seven years, but only in New York, never anywhere else. But now all of a sudden we're going to Nashville. So I said, well, that's interesting. I wonder what that's going to be like. And uh, at the time I was in a band called The Blues Project, and we were on the road 
when I had to go to do the blood on blood session. So I, so I had, they went back to New York. I think we were in um, Ohio. And, uh, and I stayed an extra day in Ohio and then caught the plane to Nashville. And, uh, and I, I didn't know the musicians or anything. And, and uh, uh, because of the time that I already spent with Bob, uh, they, were, they wanted me to be a music director and teach the songs to the band because I knew the songs. So I didn't have any problem with that. And, but the people in the, the studio musicians were so nice to me. And also Robbie Robertson came as well. He and I shared a room together here. And, uh, and we knew each other pretty well. And uh, so the main thing that was different was uh, that I had to teach them the songs, and I didn't know these guys at all. And these were like the top studio musicians in Nashville. But they were much closer to my age than the musicians I played with in New York. As, like I said, so now I'm 22, and these guys are probably between 24 and 28. In New York, the musicians were between 40 and 50. So that was very different and, and on my side, because they were closer to my age. Okay. And they were, like I said, they were all so nice that there was no problem whatsoever. And Bob had a piano put in his hotel room. And I would go there at the beginning of the day, and he would teach me one of the songs, and I would play it over and over, and he would sit there and work on the lyrics. But he came here without songs ready, right? Was it just kind of ideas? No, no, he had songs. He had songs but 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 as as it got closer to being put on tape, uh, he had misgivings and wanted the lyrics to be better, which is a good thing. Uh, so, and this is pre uh, cassette recorders. Uh, so, uh, you know, a few more years, and he could have just had a cassette playing of it and done this, but. I was the cassette player. <laughs> so I had to play these songs over and over in his room. And I got to know them pretty well. And I also had arrangement ideas for them. So I said to him after the second day, I said, why don't you uh, come to the session two hours late and let me teach them a couple of these songs before you get there so you don't have to sit through that. And he said, I like that. <laughs> it gives, gives me more time to work on the lyrics, too. So, so, then, so I started doing that pretty early on. Now, uh, many of the accounts of the Blonde on Blonde sessions, including a, a piece I just reread that was in Nashville scene, there's a lot of factual errors in them. And, and everything that I did with Bob that I can thankfully still remember, uh, there, are, there are bad uh, mistakes in the history of them, which led me to believe that all history is like that. Because, you know, who am I? I happen to be at these things that were like gargantuan moments in musical time. And, and that's how I know that the way they're reported is incorrect, because I was there. Like, they, they didn't boo him at Newport. They were upset because he played for 20 minutes. And Pete Seeger did not try and chop down the sound system with an ax. <laughs> I mean, this is unbelievable that this is what history is. And, and so, and then you go back and go, did Paul Revere really write <laughs> And you start thinking about all this stuff, and, it, and it, it's, a, it's a flawed system. And, and I think, uh, 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 with all due respect, again, uh, journalism 
is the reason that it's a, a flawed <coughs> subject. So, so I can I can point to a lot of the first thing is when we when we came here, it was just for one visit. It, it, now I don't know if it was like a, it, it had to be at least a week, but it could have been ten days. But we didn't come back again, and and that's often said that we came back and did it in two shots. The reason was he had a live gig and it cut into the studio time, so he had to come back after the live gig and reassemble. Now that live gig could have been and should have been canceled, but that's not in the journalism. So uh, I once had a guy talk to me on the phone, an, an English writer, uh, and he said, uh, uh, but, but, uh, the second time you came back to finish the album, I said, no, there, there was only one trip there. He says, no, there was two. <laughs> and I said, I was there. Are you telling me that I don't know that, that there was another visit? And, you know, that, that would shut him up. <laughs> but there are some guys that, that go, no, you just don't remember, they say to me. <laughs> I said, you know, and there's a, there's a guy, what's his name, Michael Gray. He's my least favorite Dylan writer. He wrote the, uh, the Bob Dylan Encyclopedia, which I recommend you don't buy <laughs> or return. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you have any, any moments in the studio, any, any moments that really stand out that you really enjoy in, in terms of making the record? Well, I was just going to say, uh, as, some of the stories in that Nashville scene article, you know, never happened. Right. Such know. as uh, for uh, uh, Rainy Day Women. Nobody went out and got drinks for the band, you know, to get them high or <laughs> so that they could play Everybody Must Get Stoned. These were really professional people. And they wouldn't, they wouldn't do anything like that. And 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 uh, uh, and Bob wanted it to sound like a Salvation Army band. They did call up, uh, I think his name was Wayne Butler, at two o'clock in the morning. He's a trombone player. And Charlie McCoy called and said, "Wayne, can you come down here as soon as possible? We need you to play on a track." And he said, "Sure, I'll be there as soon as I can." And he arrived 45 minutes later in a shirt and tie, clean shaven, <laughs> with his trombone, like raring to go. We did two takes, and he thanked everybody and went back home. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great story. That's great. You don't, you don't see that. <laughs> uh, so when, when we cut that, um, uh, I didn't, play organ on it because it was an inappropriate instrument for the arrangement. And uh, uh, so I, I played tambourine and I did most of the yelling and screaming on it. Because <laughs> I, I was trying to get the other guy, the other guys were a little more bashful about doing that. And, but I did crack Bob up about two times. <laughs> which was good. And, and then the other guys, by the time we were done, they, they, everybody was yelling and screaming. So it was good. And, uh, and then I read that uh, Kenny Buttry, who was the drummer, was walking around playing a, a bass drum like that. Well, how could he walk around and play the bass drum, you know, if they're miking it? <laughs> so that you know, there were, there were there's a lot of misreporting uh, uh, throughout my entire history with Bob. So uh, that's one of the reasons that I'll do this, uh, to, but not as much as they want me to do it. <laughs> what are some of your favorite tracks from the record? Just favorite songs that you you, you still appreciate from? Well, I really like, well, the thing, the thing is, it's, it's my favorite Dylan album, and, and at, at the time I was a, you know, a Dylan fan, like a Dylan fan. And 
And when that happens, when I play with someone or produce them, uh, I really like it when my favorite album is not one that I was on, you know, where I could judge it objectively and say, you know, I love this album. Uh, for instance, uh, I, I produced the Tube's first album. But my favorite Tube stuff is on other albums. Uh, not that I don't like the album that I did with them, but my favorite Tube stuff is on other albums. So I, I sort of hate that Bond on Bond is my favorite Dylan album, because <laughs> it looks like something else. Sure. <laughs> uh, but it is. And it, and it was an amazing experience. Uh, uh, my f one of my favorite tracks is uh, uh, Memphis Blues again, because uh, in actuality, I mean, we're out there jamming, and they're recording it, and, uh, and I was playing with uh, uh, Trading Licks with Joe South, who hadn't become famous yet but was an amazing guitar player and bass player. And, and I was trying to keep up with him, which was no mean feat. And when I listened to that track, I cannot believe that I was 22 years old and played the stuff that I played on that. Because I, I don't even know if I could play like that now. Uh, so, so that's a kick for me. And, and uh, uh, Said I'd Lady of the Lowlands, and Just Like a Woman, those two songs, to me, are the epitome of music that sounds like four o'clock in the morning. Mostly because it was. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, but it, but it captures that better than anything else I, I've ever heard in my life. You would think, you know, maybe there's a Sinatra track or something like that, but those two tracks are very 4 a.m. And, and, uh, and I haven't really heard anybody top those for that particular facet of it. Yeah. Well, Dylan has said that that album captures what he's always heard in his head for his music more than any other album that that album did. I mean, what, what do you think about it technically in terms of how it was recorded and, and engineered? And can you, can you hear that as well, just from a technical standpoint? Well, see, I couldn't, I couldn't concentrate on that because because I had, I really had my hands full. <laughs> uh, one of Looking the, back, just in terms of how people thought like, it's such a timeless recording now, I mean, can you hear why people do it that way? Well, yes, but I think that that's, uh, uh, what's great about it is how all these things came together, that there was, you know, good engineering and mixing, ridiculous band, and great songs. So, it, all those things had to come together for it to be such a great album. And, uh, and I had a, a moment where we were, I don't know what song it was, we were playing some song and, and uh, they had to change a microphone. And I was sitting there going, now I had just, I had lived through Highway 61 and, and how people made it into you know, this gigantic thing, and like a Rolling Stone. And so I was sitting there going, God, wherever I put my fingers here is gonna be forever. It's, I'm gonna hear this like 50 years from now. And I went, shut up. <laughs> Please don't think like that. <laughs> Go back to the way you were thinking, just play. So that happened once, and I, and I did cut it off at the pass. Uh, when, when I was sitting in his room playing the songs for him to write the lyrics to, the one that I really loved was, I want you. So when he'd come in every day, I'd say, uh, he said, what do you want to do? I said, well, I taught them this and this. And he said, okay. And he would usually tell me the night before what songs to do, and I'd say, uh, how about I want you? And he'd say, no, no, no. And, go, and so I think it was the last song we recorded, because he was just screwing with me. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, but I had, I, I loved the arrangement that I had for it, and I couldn't wait for them to do that. 
So finally, the last day, we're running it down, and uh, it's a. Uh, like 16th notes on the guitar, and I went, whoa, that's amazing. So I stopped the band and I said, uh, Wayne, can you do that every time that that part happens? And he said, sure, and I went, this is unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the whole time, the seven years that I was in New York, I, I never heard anybody play something like that on the fly. And, and he, would, he was great, he said, sure, I can do that. So, so every time I hear that lick, it makes me smile, you know. And, and they played the arrangement that I had in my head so, so much better than I thought it could be. It was just, it's, so that's a big favor of mine. That's great. I'm gonna, I'm gonna open it up for some of the students to ask them some questions too. And, Hey, when we wrap up here in about 15 minutes, um, Al is going to stay around. He's got a few CDs over here if you're interested in a CD, if you, if you want to sign something, if you want to have a chance to say hello to him, be sure to stick around afterwards. But no, you, no flash. Yeah, no flash photography. <laughs> so. I have uh, uh, I, I've, uh, uh, lost two-thirds of my vision to some weird eye stuff, and uh, uh, flash really screws my eyes up, and so that's why I'm asking. It's not because I'm... Uh, Audrey Hepburn. <laughs> Definitely, you can see that. <laughs> so, if you get to you guys, I'd love to hear some questions. Yeah. Uh, just with all that you've done in your career, um, you know, a lot of people are going to associate with Bob Dylan stuff. But for you personally, what's what do you feel is your greatest achievement, or what are you most proud of? That you've done? I can't single anything out. Uh, I would say, you know, the biggest thing is definitely like a Rolling Stone. But, but there, are, uh, there are other things, uh, fortunately, you know, that was great. It was great when I was about, uh, also when I was 21, that was some song that I co-wrote was the number one song in the country. That was pretty amazing for me and never duplicated. <laughs> and, and, you know, and other things, you know, playing with uh, Hendrix and The Who and, and uh, you know, all these other people. Uh, it's all really great stuff, so it's hard to single out anything. It's just, it's, you know, it's, it's, I wrote a book because it's like, what do, you know, if you look at it on paper, if I look at it on paper, I go, I can't believe I did this. And I, I should write about this because it's ludicrous what I did. So that's why I wrote the book. Uh, but but I would say, so I, I would say probably like a Rolling Stone because because it's called the, the number one song of all time. <laughs> I can't top that. <laughs> Who else? Uh, how was working with Leonard Skinner? Like whenever you found them, like what were they playing like, and how much did you have like an influence on their their sound and whatever you were producing? I heard them. I heard him in a club in Atlanta. I was in Atlanta for a month producing another band uh, that wasn't from Atlanta. We just wanted to record at this studio, and I wanted to use some of the guys from the Atlanta rhythm section who were friends of mine. And so we'd work from uh, uh, noon to eight every day, and then we'd go out and party every night. And, uh, and I, I knew a guy that owned a club there, and. And he, you know, we'd go there every night after dinner, and he had a VIP section he'd put us in, and, and it was, you know, pretty great. And in those days, uh, if you played in a club, you played for six days, not just one night, but I mean six nights, from uh, 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 Tuesday to through Sunday, and Monday was off. So if you were on the road, you had to play, you know, six nights in each town. And uh, people forget that, but that, that's how it was back then. So this was about 1972. And uh, 
And we'd go to this club every night. So the first week we were there, the same band played every night, and they were okay. And I, I, we were more interested in uh, 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 socializing than the band anyway. So the second week, new band, and I saw the, the name on the uh, marquee, and I went, what is this, Liner Skyner, what is this? <laughs> so, uh, and, and they, had, they were from Jacksonville and they had never played Atlanta. And, uh, and so I went, oh, a new band, this is good. And they started playing and I said, this is very good. This is very good. And, and by the third night, I had favorites because they played, you know, the same songs and they played you know, at least three sets a night. And uh, the band at that time was uh, no keyboard player and uh, two guitars. So it was a, a little different, but the songs were all there. Now, I, I remember that my favorite was uh, I Ain't The One. And, uh, and Freebird. I just thought, this is unbelievable. So maybe the fourth night, I asked if I could sit in. And because there was no keyboard player, I had to play guitar. So I went up there and, I, and, uh, and they knew who I was, which was flattering. And uh, so I said, what are we doing? And Ronnie Van Zandt said, uh, Mean Woman Blues in C sharp. And I, thought, and I just cracked up laughing because that's like a genius thing to do if you're a musician and somebody's gonna play guitar with you and they're known for playing the organ. Uh, if you call C sharp, then if they don't really know what they're doing, they can't do it. You know, if they're really an amateur guitar player. And so when he said C sharp, it just made me laugh. I said, oh, I see what he's doing. No, I can do it. And when we played Mean Woman Booze and C sharp, and, uh, and as the week went by, we sort of became friends. And, and the last night, I, I asked them if, uh, you know, I would like to sign them to a production deal. I thought they were great, and I wanted to record them. And uh, we talked for the next few months and made a deal. Uh, but uh, uh, I think my influence was more in the... Uh, producing and engineering than touching the music because they were they were brilliant arrangers. And that's one of the things that I loved about it. And just went, I mean, Sweet Home Alabama sounds like something that could have been cut at the Blonde on Blonde sessions by these amazing studio musicians. And these guys were like 23 when, when we cut Sweet Home Alabama. And, and Freebird, once I, you know, knew what its name was and all this, and I was going, I said, I can't wait to put this out. I can't imagine any young man between the ages of 12 and 30 that when he hears this, will not put his head down like this and run into the nearest wall. <laughs> <laughs> and I was right. <laughs> And uh, uh, what amazes me the most is that uh, Sweet Home Alabama outlasted Freebird. I think that's amazing. But it's, it's, a, and it's great to hear it on the radio because I mixed it. You know, and I, and I did a lot of the engineering on the first album. So uh, it, it's all good stuff for me. It was a, it was a great experience and, uh, and I'm really glad that, uh, and one of the reasons I, I took this speaking engagement was uh, Ed King lives here, and I can see him, you know? So, uh, you know, we're still friends. Any other questions? Yeah, yeah. Um, I have a question about a particular villain track on Blonde on Blonde, fourth time around. Um, it's the popular legend, and I don't know how valid this is, is that it's a response to a track that John Lennon wrote, uh, Norwegian Wood. And there's a great quote out there saying that fourth time around is Bob Dylan imitating uh, John Lennon imitating Bob Dylan. 
That's a great, that, you don't have to go any further. Okay. That's a great question, and I have a great answer to it. Okay. <laughs> uh, when we were uh, running it down, I, I said to Bob, flat out, I said, don't you think you're going to get a little shit about this yeah. from the Beatles? And he said, uh, no. <laughs> he said, I think I should have given them shit about Norwegian Wood. <laughs> so I think it's the other way around. Yeah. Yeah. I think they, stole, they heard this song live, you know, in a room where they pass guitars around. And I think they took that song and stole it from him. And, you know, neither of them were going to jump on each other about it legally. So, fine, no problem. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, good point. Yeah. Um, so you were around, like, and actually in the room when the was writing lyrics, and I was just wondering, um, could you comment on his writing style? If he no, I, wa I wasn't. In, I mean, he, he had written all these songs. Mm -hmm. But he was polishing the lyrics because they were going to be set down forever. And he felt that they weren't, the lyrics that he had weren't good enough. So, so I, the songs were already written. They were just being re-lyricized, if I may. Did he, did he talk with anyone else about edits that he might have done? Did he change lyrics in between takes? No, I mean, uh, I mean to the point where Sometimes we'd go to the studio and we, uh, well, we'd get there at uh, uh, maybe uh, 10 or 12, and for two hours I'd teach them the songs of the day. And then Bob would come in, and more often than not, he would sit down at the piano and still working on the lyrics. And, and we'd go play ping pong and watch TV, and uh, one time, uh, a, a journalist got in somehow, and uh, and they and they threw him out, and then he got back in again about 5 p.m. So he was there at 12, and Bob sitting at the piano working, and then he he got back in at 5 again, and there was Bob still at the piano working, and he went. God, what's that guy on? And uh, Albert Grossman said, um, Columbia Records and Tapes. <laughs> uh, but uh, th we didn't really discuss it. Uh, I, I, like I said, I, my job was a human cassette recorder, and his job was obvious. But I mean, he didn't, he didn't say, is this a good line? Or he just said, no, no, play the bridge over again. Just keep playing the bridge. And like that. That, that was the extent of our conversations during that. Have one time for one more question. Um, and I have a question about one of the tracks from Long and Long. I've heard before, and I was wondering if it was ever written about Seven, because I was wondering if you were lonely in the I'm sorry, I can you hear you. Seven, Lady of the Lowlands, the recording of it. I've heard before that it was kind of spontaneous, and that the band didn't know how long it was going to keep going for. They just kept going like off what Bob was doing. Is that true? Sort of. Uh, when, uh, well, I mean, we had to learn the verses and the chorus, those two separate ingredients. And then in, and at the end of every chorus, there was a little four bar segment, and then it would go into the next verse. And, uh, uh, and we, we didn't really have an ending. We, we thought it was just going to fade, and uh, and as and we play the the little lick, and we figured when he was done, he would stop singing, and we'd just play the music, and we'd play one verse and chorus, and that would be enough for them to fade. And so we're playing, and he never stopped singing, <laughs> <laughs> and we were all looking at each other. I mean, me too because I didn't know how long it was going to be. And, uh, and we just looking at each other and, you know, smiling. Just going, uh, I think we're going to break 
the land speed record here. <laughs> and uh, uh, so, so that's what happened. And uh, fortunately, you know, we just kept going. But we were, yes, we were totally surprised and had no idea it was going to be that long, but it didn't throw us. Does that answer your question? Yes, okay. Would you guys thank uh, Alfred for being here? Alan, a few CDs over here if you're interested. We also have a scanner over here for credit over by that.